Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this 10.20 a.m. of course mountain time uh, session titled Police Practice and Culture. This is the last session of the day and of our conference. Uh, it's been a fantastic lineup of speakers and so I am excited to kick off the last one. Um, right, we've got three speakers for this panel. We've got Peter Kraska, Tony Chang, and Carrie Sanders. Each presenter will speak for 20 minutes and we will hold off Q&A like all the other sessions uh, until the very end. But please get those questions into the uh, YouTube chat and we will be sure to communicate them to our speakers. So let's get started. First, I welcome Peter Kraska from the University of Eastern Kentucky, who is going to present to us a paper titled Police Militarization 101, Trends, Consequences and Clarifications. Over to you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Does that look okay? So my new title is <laughs> From the Vietnam War to Brianna Taylor, Police Militarization Trends and Consequences. Uh, I, uh, my name is Pete Kraska at Eastern Kentucky University. Um, I've been working most recently on various civil rights cases and doing some activist work around the United States. Um, I appreciate Kevin Haggerty uh, inviting me. And I worked with Kevin and the late Richard Erickson many years ago. And uh, it's nice to, to, to reconnect. Um, I want to start out by saying that my uh, presentation analysis is pretty depressing. It's certainly looking at the dark side of things, but I think it's important to note up front that we have this simultaneous progression and regression of American policing. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, you know, to me, it's pretty clear which has the most momentum. It's the regressive forces, but, uh, you know, throughout my career, and, uh, and certainly right now, I've worked with all kinds of different police folks that uh, are on the progressive end, end of things and they don't like the direction things are going and they'd really like to see some change. So uh, despite the, the pretty uh, pessimistic portrayal I'm going to uh, lay out, um, that doesn't mean that there aren't cracks of hope. And uh, I certainly work personally within those cracks trying to bring about some individual instances of justice and some substantive changes to policing. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've overheard um, and, and heard from people over the last 25 years that police militarization is nothing new. They say that police have always been militarized. And of course, they're right. Uh, the police function is rooted in government authorized violence, just like the military and is therefore by necessity militarized. There's no doubt the police and military have always shared key features. However, the issue and phenomenon of police militarization centers on the extent to which the police are militarized. It matters greatly whether the police institution or a specific police agency is characterized by low militarization versus high militarization. Um, there, here's an abbreviated version uh, of a depiction of the four major dimensions of police militarization along four continuums. Uh, these dimensions include the material dimension, what we usually think of as police militarization, uh, heavy weaponry, armored personnel carriers, battle dress uniforms, advanced military technology. But of course, there's also a cultural dimension, which includes martial language, appearance, ideology, the ideology of militarism, and then you have an organizational and operational dimension. I won't get into those. So the extent of police militarization matters. And in the US, the research and literature documents quantitatively and qualitatively a dramatic, long lasting, deeply embedded, unequivocal and highly consequential march down these continuums. The first point I'd like to make today concerns when and how this happened. Questioning a common assumption about the genesis of the contemporary rise and normalization of this phenomenon. Uh, Radley Balco, 
who now works as a columnist for the Washington Post, wrote a very popular book in 2014 titled The Rise of the Warrior Cop. He provides a solid descriptive examination of the history of police militarization and settles on Daryl Gates and LAPD formation of a SWAT team in the 1960s and the 19, Nixon's 1970s drug war. He marks these as the beginning of contemporary police militarization. I certainly agree that these events were important, but they were highly localized within just a few police departments. And they had a negligible influence on most police agencies for a 20 year period from 1968 to 1988. The real shift, the event that brought the entire US police institution rapidly down the militarization continuum occurred as a result of Ronald Reagan's conservative revolution, which included the 1980s war on drugs. This war, as we're all aware, focused mostly on those people in neighborhoods, specifically black people and black neighborhoods, suspected of being involved in using, possessing, and trafficking in crack cocaine. As just one example of this consequential shift, let's look at this next slide, which depicts stylistically and quantitatively the US police institution embarking on an intensely punitive campaign in poor and minority neighborhoods, conducting no knock and quick knock drug raids on people's private residences using literally the US Navy special operations model for rescuing hostages. This is where teams of eight to 32 fully armed and militarily outfitted police officers conduct surprise dynamic entries into people's homes while they're sleeping. They often break and rake the home's windows in order to deploy stun grenades, break down, break down the door using a battering ram, rush through the residence with heavy weaponry, all for the purpose of maybe finding some evidence of low level drug offenses. I've unfortunately worked on dozens of civil rights cases where this extremely high risk, low reward approach, risk by the way, the police themselves are manufacturing, results in lethal tragedy, either for an occupant or a police officer. This is nothing to say of the everyday terror in these neighborhoods of the police conducting routine nighttime police paramilitary raids. We found that many police departments were conducting 100 to 500 of these types of raids per year. And of course, this is exactly what happened on the night, <clears throat> excuse me, on the night of March 13th, 2020, when a tactical team from the Louisville Metro Police Department broke in to a home and within seconds shot and killed an unarmed Breonna Taylor. No evidence of drug offenses were found. <clears throat> There's no doubt that numerous economic and social factors uh, have, have, uh, have contributed to this trend. What I'd like to posit today as my second key point is the critical role that culture played. William, William Gibbs, Gibson in 1994 wrote a brilliant and prescient book titled Warrior Dreams, Paramilitary Culture in Post-Vietnam America. His thesis was that America's defeat in Vietnam led to a reassertion as embodied politically in Ronald Reagan's effort to reclaim US military superiority of pride-filled militarized masculinity, a type of manhood where men fantasize themselves as honorable warriors fighting outside the corrupt establishment and government imposed restrictions to restore the United States sense of power, virtue and superiority. He documented the rise of right-wing paramilitary gun culture and predicted accurately its increasingly deep imprint on American political culture. As one observer of Gibson book states, quote, losing the Vietnam War to a technologically inferior enemy compounded by the challenges to the status quo from feminism and minority groups created a profound crisis in American identity, particularly for the white American male, and gave birth to a disturbing and reactionary new war culture designed to make America well again. Gibson set, sets out to map this new American war zone 
He plays paintball with weekend warriors, visits a for-profit gun ranch, and parties with soldiers of fortune at their annual convention. He surveys the combat magazines and weapons advertisements filled films and novels that fuel the sexual violent fantasies of millions of would-be Rambo warriors across the country. One group of wannabe soldiers Gibson gives attention to are police officers, fully enthralled with this warrior subculture. Gibson's work was an inspiration to me because I could find no police scholars that noticed and wrote about this trend, despite the fact that it had been happening for nearly 10 years before I started researching it. And just to be clear, many high-end police scholars still do not acknowledge this trend and its consequences, possibly due to its connections with the reforms they themselves champion. At the same time, Gibson embedded himself within the Soldier of Fortune subculture. I conducted a two year long ethnography with newly formed SWAT team members who were primarily executing no-knock raids on what they called crack cribs. As one paramilitary cop explained to me, while wearing a t-shirt emblazoned with the phrase Operation Ghetto Storm, quote, we're the only ones doing what needs to be done, end quote. I discovered that these officers were intoxicated with the ideology of, mili <clears throat> of militarism and relentless in promoting paramilitary weaponry, culture, and practices, not only in their own police agencies, but in surrounding agencies. And of course, given the macro cultural context documented by Gibson, they were selling this paradigm to a highly receptive audience. I also found that police trade magazines, police trainers, and for-profit training camps employing ex-military special operations soldiers were just as aggressively pushing this quote, tactical end quote uh, uh, turn, uh, tactical being a synonym for paramilitary. It was this ground level of research that prompted me to conduct two national uh, police studies which uh, uh, found that the culture, weaponry, and activities were rapidly becoming normalized in both large and small police departments in the United States. And these were easily overshadowing and uh, much more influential in hindsight than the so-called community policing revolution that was supposedly happening at the same time. No one should have been surprised about the rejection of legitimate community policing efforts and the welcoming of militarization. American policing is hardwired for aggression and violence. They're told and they tell themselves they're the thin blue line and that waging a war of aggression is the central instrument for keeping society from unraveling. I'd now like to uh, shift the focus from police militariz militarization's cultural history to today's uh, situation. In other words, a few things to think about with regards to where things stand right now. And I want to do this just using the simplistic notion of, of myths. First of all, uh, today, uh, police militarization is all about SWAT teams. Uh, certainly might have been true in the 1980s and 1990s, but definitely not true today. And the main reason for this is the notion of dispersion. The military model has worked its way into numerous aspects of law enforcement, normalizing its presence. Uh, one example is the tactical turn of regular road patrol officers. Seduced by paramilitary culture and an outsized concern for, uh, for uh, minimizing all risk, regular patrol officers are receiving military style training and weaponry. A tragic case I worked on happened in 2017 in Dallas, Texas, where a 15 year old African, African American boy was fatally shot in the back of the head by an officer using an AR-15 rifle while driving away from a high school party. This case should have raised serious questions about the negative consequences of outfitting all road patrol officers with this level of weaponry, but it did not. Um, another example, Another example is the routine militarization of drug control squads that are fully outfitted as if they're a SWAT team. This was the case in the Breonna Taylor killing. The military model approach became so commonplace that the Louisville Metropolitan Police Department 
used the dynamic entry approach in nearly all warrants executed, whether they were formally approved of as a no-knock or not. In fact, one researcher found that out of the 74 normal knock and announce warrants, the drug, war, uh, the drug team executed, every one of them employed the nighttime no-knock approach. In other words, they only received a knock and announce warrant and every single one of them was executed as a no-knock in the middle of the night. It was just normalized. And I've found this again and again as an expert witness in San Antonio, different places, and I'll come in and find out that the police department could care less about constitutional restrictions when it comes to conducting drug raids. Myth number two, police militarization is all about explicit state violence. Um, yes, police militarization includes a heavy dose of explicit state violence or what have some have called the iron fist. This has been painfully evident in the way in which the US responds, responded to the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor civil protests. Um, I'm working on several civil rights cases that deal with uh, young folks in the US protesting these, uh, these killings and the police response has just been truly dreadful. Um, something that even I wouldn't have predicted, the, the, just the level of aggression and militarized violence. Um, the first slide I showed was from the Standing Rock pro prote uh, protest of the Dakota Pipeline in, two seven, in 2017. Again, uh, dreadful and intensely militarized. But there's more to this story than the Iron Fist. The velvet glove of regulatory police measures is increasingly working hand in hand. Much of this has to do with the emergence of a massive extraction industry, a dimension of criminal justice growth complex that's less overt, but, but not, not any less punitive um, in its engagement. The 2014 events in Ferguson, Missouri exposed clearly this regulatory dimension of police militarization. So seven months after the protest, where the police displayed this really ostentatious level of militarization and it shocked the nation, the US Department of Justice did its own investigation. And the US Department of Justice came to the final conclusion. This was what they said was the takeaway from all of what happened in Ferguson. Ferguson's law enforcement practices are shaped by the city's focus on, on generating revenue rather than by public safety needs. Politicians and the media fixated on police militarization and therefore overlooked the symbiotic relationship between police militarization and revenue generation for the city's coffers. One observer, a journalist friend of mine put it this way, the town of Ferguson, while small in scale, is an Orwellian monstrosity. Its racially biased police department is the enforcement wing of a predatory system of government. The city's white dominated council governs a mostly black city and its oppressive biased justice system is an instrument of fiscal domination. Court fines account for a fifth of the city's revenue. The city issues three warrants per family household and its draconian, draconian justice system appears designed to bleed its victims. The events in Ferguson point to a yet to be reckoned with trend in criminal justice functioning, extracting revenue directly from the poor and disproportionately from racial minorities via the, the crime control complex for the benefit of the complex itself. This is a deliberate project of accumulation by disposition of those caught in the criminal justice web. In order to enact this project, the state has fabricated on its left hand a Kafkaesque matrix of technologies, laws, bureaucratic rules, fines, civil asset forfeiture, processing fees, surveillance systems, payment plans, and elaborate systems of debt and interest penalties. And on the right, the iron fist of police militarization. <clears throat> Myth number three, the gear. It's all about the gear. What I wanted to accentuate here is a lot of academic 
developing researchers, I think because they have access to 1033 program data, which is where the military transfers uh, the discards of war directly to local police departments in the United States, billions and billions of dollars of goods. And so a lot of concentration, there's a lot of emphasis on the material aspects of police militarization. But I want to emphasize, particularly being on this panel, that the cultural element is, is really critical. Um, a couple of features of the cultural element that I didn't mention include a, a for-profit training industry that cultivates an intense fear of personal victimization in the police alongside teaching a toxic warriorism that instructs police, for example, to shoot first and worry about court later. If you're interested, look up David Grossman. He's one of the most popular police trainers in this genre. One observer describes Grossman's training as, quote, fear porn, which he couples with quotes like this, David Grossman. The officer is the hero, the warrior, the noble figure who steps into dark situations where others fear to tread and brings order to a chaotic world, and who does so by imposing their will on the civilians they deal with, end quote. I also want to note the recent popularity of the imagery in, in this slide in contemporary policing. It comes from a comic book series and movie, The Punisher, and is a type of totem for many police and military personnel, displaying it on their uniforms, gear, and I've seen it on a lot of patrol cars. The Punisher cultural themes are quite similar to what William Gibson outlined his book in his book outlined in his book in 1994, the warrior lone wolf willing to do what others aren't, willing to take back the street in a way that doesn't involve the constraints of a weak and corrupt government. All right, to finish up, I'm certainly at a different point in my career uh, in terms of researching and writing. I'm doing some of that, but most of my work right now is in the area of policy and civil rights work. I uh, work with uh, a lot of civil rights attorneys and, uh, and most recently, I've done a lot of work with Campaign Zero, which is an activist organization run by DeRay McKesson. And uh, we've certainly talked to a lot of politicians and a lot of local police folks trying to change different laws and policies with some mild successes. But I have to be honest, between the re regressive and the progressive elements in policing, just like there are in society, you have both. And we have simultaneous progression and regression. But if you're to look at soberly where the momentum is, clearly the momentum is in a regression, regressive direction. And uh, something needs to be done, something needs to give. I'm not sure it's gonna happen in the United States. There's a chance things are gonna get a lot worse before they get better. But of course we have to, uh, keep doing the hard work and try. Thank you. Thank you uh, for a very thought provoking talk. And thanks for connecting that to some of the policy work that you're doing right now. I think that's um, a really important perspective. Okay, so our next speaker is Tony Chang from UC Irvine, and he'll be presenting a talk titled Blue Illusions, Machine Policing and the Production of Public Input. Over to you. Thanks so much. Um, and hopefully my screen should have shared. Um, okay. Um, so uh, thank you everyone again for being here today uh, to my fellow panelists, uh, to Holly, Sandra, uh, Kevin, Jeffrey, and the center for organizing this amazing event. Um, so today I'm gonna be providing an overview of uh, what I hope to be my book manuscript, uh, again, called Blue Illusions, Machine Policing and the Production of Public Input. Um, and so I want to begin with a story. Uh, so during one of the police community meetings that I attended in 2018 uh, in New York City, uh, I met an African-American man in the mid thirties uh, named James Jones. And so James is the leader of a nonprofit organization that is focused on uh, providing activities to youth in the community. And so he was organizing a summer kickoff event and invited me to, to the outdoor barbecue uh, in a nearby park. Um, so James always believed in the importance of police community relations, uh, especially for youth in the community. 
Uh, so he invites the police precinct to a summer kickoff event every year, even though they never attend. Uh, and so, in fact, James was previ previously elected to the board of his community council, uh, which are resident run boards in every precinct in New York City that are designed to facilitate police community relations. Um, however, he was terminated from his position due to a conflict of interest uh, with his nonprofit affiliation, which was interested in doing cop watching at the time. Uh, cop watching, cop watching being the systematic recording of police interactions to guard against uh, misconduct. Um, and so nonetheless, uh, I arrived early to help James set up for the summer kickoff event. And the most memorable task was obtaining electricity. Uh, so that's a key resource to hold any outdoor event uh, for the sound system, the DJ equipment and things like that. And so this seemingly trivial task of obtaining electricity actually occupied every volunteer's attention for nearly 20 minutes. Um, and the reason was because connecting electricity was no easy task. Uh, so a couple of weeks earlier, James had to convince a family member, uh, a family friend to power the event by connecting a series of extension cords uh, to his third floor apartment uh, that was perpendicular to the park. Um, so there we were, us catchers, about 20 feet away from the abutting park, all hoping to catch the extension cord. Um, however, New York City windows actually had bars on them, which meant that the tosser had to uh, reach through the opening between the bars and toss the cord sideways. Uh, not only that, uh, he had to clear the fence surrounding the park, which meant that short tosses equated to fail tosses. Um, and so attempt number one was a failure. The, the cord fell to the ground without clearing the fence. Uh, the, the tosser then had to painstakingly reel the cord back in, uh, hand over hand, back up to his third floor apartment. Uh, attempt number two failed again, and the tosser uh, was, and as the tosser was reeling the cord back in once more, uh, additional catchers began congregating and yelling out directions like, you got to lasso it. Um, and everyone began demonstrating this technique by hand because we weren't quite sure if the tosser could hear us over uh, the New York City traffic. Uh, so after a few more tries, we finally succeeded. Uh, we connected the electricity and then, the, and then we rushed off to finish the remaining task. Um, and so now in contrast to these challenges, when I asked the president of the community council, uh, remember these are the boards that are designed to facilitate police community relations, uh, which James was kicked off of. Um, when I asked the president how they connected electricity for their events, he explained, uh, we can go to one of the officers and they'll come out and get, help us get electricity from the light. Uh, so in other words, uh, because police departments are the city agency that can provide access to public utilities like streetlights, uh, obtaining electricity for community council events is as easy as getting the officer to plug the extension cord into the nearest light pole. Um, and so in the aggregate, uh, such assistance by the police department itself eases the execution of public events, enabling certain organizations to avoid logistical hurdles and resource burdens and focus more on the substantive goals of their events. Um, and these interactions matter because they enable police to exert influence over the operations of community groups. Uh, so during the community council's major annual event, they give out community awards uh, in the weeks leading up to it, the community council president actually received a phone call from the, from the commanding officer directly, asking him if he can give two awards to two specific officers within the precinct. Uh, and as we can see here, not only did the two officers receive the community awards, uh, but the precinct also tweeted about it, uh, making sure that the public knew about the community council's uh, endorsement of the quality of current policing. Um, and so to be clear, the precinct both provided the resources to execute the event uh, and arranged for the officers to have uh, to receive awards during it. Um, and so in my book uh, manuscript, I argue that these interactions and exchanges are all part of a strategic of a strategic politics uh, that police engage in to cultivate constituents uh, and to resist institutional reforms. Um, and so all these practices take on greater significance in the current moment. Uh, the police killings of the 2010s uh, sparked an extraordinary call um, to action against the ongoing harms that American policing brings to uh, minoritized communities. Um, and these killings also reveal just how thin the line is between police conduct and misconduct. And so as demands for police transformation escalate, um, a key question that I asked there in the book uh, is, uh, how are police departments navigating such intensifying public scrutiny? 
Um, so my argument focuses on how police departments cultivate political capital uh, by engaging in a strategic politics of distributing public resources, regulatory leniency, and coercive force. Um, and so by political capital, I mean uh, stocks of influence earned through relationships, which can be uh, mobilized to achieve political goals, such as uh, legitimacy or power. And I refer to this strategic politics as machine policing. Uh, so rather than dominant understandings of police community relations, uh, suggesting that we either need to build them or that these relationships are quite meaningless and inconsequential, uh, the, the key takeaway from the book uh, is that police community relations do not need to be built. Uh, instead, those that already exist are precisely what impede the potential for police transformation. Um, and so to briefly dive deeper into the concept of machine policing, uh, again, I had the definition of it on top. Uh, in terms of why police departments are pursuing machine policing, uh, my theory focuses on how police may want public legitimacy, but not at the expense of organizational independence. Uh, and so in other words, uh, police are not really legitimacy maximizers, they are legitimacy optimizers. Uh, they seek to develop trustworthy relationships with only the subset of the public needed to maintain uh, independent decision-making over department operations. Um, and so I, I try to position my theory in conversation with scholarship on policing organizations, uh, democratic governance, especially about the role of public input and community participation in achieving democratic governance, and urban politics uh, with research on clientelism and alternative mechanisms that complement or substitute uh, state processes of representation and resource distribution. Um, and so the reason why machine policing matters so much is because it creates an illusion of public input. Uh, it establishes a social order where community preferences towards police emerge with either a stage uh, or through struggle, depending on how it aligns with their pursuit of political capital. Uh, so in other words, police shape the landscape of neighborhood support towards police, uh, including which voices are amplified, how they are organized, and how they are represented. Uh, by, strategic provide, by strategically providing public resources uh, like electricity, um, and as I describe in other chapters, uh, regulatory leniency and coercive force. Uh, and so I advance this argument through a series of chapters, which roughly align with the stages of machine policing. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss the specifics of uh, chapters in Q&A. Uh, so in terms of the data and methods, uh, this study focuses on America's largest police department, the NYPD. Um, however, I would describe this as a study of police, uh, but through the community because the NYPD never granted me formal access. Um, and so I think there's an important part here about uh, we often apply the label hard to reach population to vulnerable or marginalized populations. Uh, but I do wanna make the point that institutional actors are also hard to reach, though of course for uh, very different reasons. Uh, and so broadly, I focus on three different types of uh, community organizations that centered around policing. Uh, first, I attended community council events and meetings. Uh, again, community councils are in every precinct in New York City, and they are comprised of an elected board of residents who hold public uh, monthly meetings designed to facilitate uh, community relations with the local precinct. Uh, and I focus on two community councils after randomly selecting six precincts in Brooklyn, uh, which is New York's largest and most diverse bureau. bureau. Um, and the two that I focus on drew some of the largest audiences, the most 911 calls, and the highest crime rates out of the six that I considered. Um, after starting to attend community council events, I learned about clergy councils, uh, which are very similar to community councils, except field the clergy members from the precinct. Uh, and then finally, during the course of field work, uh, I encountered organizers from various activist organizations uh, who are members of an umbrella group that I'm referring to as Rally. Uh, and so Rally represents the main network in New York City mobilizing around police accountability and justice for victims of police violence. Um, and it's important to point out that all these organizations have had some sort of formal nonprofit status. Um, and I'm happy to discuss more about my data and methods in Q and A. Uh, so for the findings, um, I'm actually gonna just focus on one extended example, uh, both because it demonstrates important parts of the argument uh, and for the sake of time. Uh, and my goal in presenting the findings is to show how and why 
uh, police invest so heavily in certain community relations, um, trying to peel back some of the layers of long cultivated community relations uh, that have positioned police um, going back to the introductory vignette uh, to direct community councils to give awards to their own officers and to tweet about that endorsement to the public. Uh, so in the early 2010s, uh, police officers in the 55th precinct killed two people, uh, both under the age of 25. Um, and so every year since then, members from both families um, have joined together to hold a basketball event in their honor called Basketball for Accountability. Uh, and one of the key goals of the event is to stop police brutality. And so on the very same day, just three blocks away from Basketball for Accountability, there was another event called the Peace Tour. Uh, so Reverend Powell is a member of the clergy council and he's been organizing the Peace Tour since 1997. Uh, so the Peace Tour is a two and a half mile walk in Brooklyn that ends with a street fair. Uh, and you can see that the NYPD even set up a rock climbing wall for the event. And so unlike Basketball for Accountability, the Peace Tour's goal was to unite police and community. And so I asked Reverend Powell if he ever thought about combining the two events, given that they're both centered around policing. Uh, I don't know if the message is, uh, that's a decision that would have to be made by the family since their son was killed by a cop. I don't know if they would, would wanna come out and play with a cop. Uh, and so I asked Reverend Powell about the logistics of the Peace Tour and whether he obtained sound permits, uh, which he replied, normally you should, yeah. And so in fact, in my FOIA requests for all sound permit applications on that date within the 55th precinct, not only returned the one for basketball for accountability, but the absence of one from the Peace Tour. Uh, and so this emphasizes the importance of not only enforcement, but also regulatory leniency toward different organizations and their events. Uh, and so activists, community organizations mobilizing against police violence actually face a practical and ideological dilemma uh, they can apply for a sound permit, uh, pay the $45 fee to the precinct and reinforce the power of the very organization that they seek to reform. Or they can forgo the sound permit, uh, incur the risk of getting shut down and lacking recourse for holding a permitless event. And so depending on the nature of the event, some organizers do get permits. Uh, so 41 year old African-American Erica Lewis who organizes basketball for accountability explained that she does get a permit for that event because it's a community centered event um, basketball event for the kids in the neighborhood. Uh, but unlike basketball for accountability, she does not get a permit for the annual vigil that she holds for her sister. So in the vigil, her supporters gather at the intersection where police killed her sister and they release balloons in her memory. Uh, and Erica explained that my sister was killed by police. I'm not gonna now go ask them for permission to have a vigil for her. Um, so for this year, after Erica and her supporters stayed in the intersection for over five minutes, uh, community officer Hines began pushing participants to clear the street. Uh, and as tension escalated, uh, officer Hines called for backup, uh, unmarked cars arrived and the vigil effectively ended. And so for the first time ever, uh, Erica decided to attend the 55th Precinct Community Council meeting to voice her frustrations. Uh, and the 55th Precinct Community Council, unlike many other ones, hosts their meetings inside the precinct itself. Um, and so Erica described going to the precinct as, it felt like I could see the detective who killed my sister at any moment, even though he don't work there anymore. It's like, I feel like I'm gonna run into him. Uh, and so nonetheless, uh, Erica and her friend Steve were two of the first uh, to arrive at the meeting. And they spoke to the president whose name is uh, Leela Passad uh, and explained to her why they were there. Uh, so, community council so community councils are actually run according to guidelines issued by the NYPD. And one of the key points about these guidelines is that they make it quite difficult for newcomers to affect uh, community council elections. And so Leela Passat has actually been president since 1998, winning 11 elections in a row with two year terms each. Uh, and only two of those elections have ever been contested. Uh, the most recent one being in 2016, which she won um, by 21 votes to five. And so to put that into perspective, 26 people um, or 0.02% of a neighborhood of 150,000 residents decided who would become president of the community council. Uh, and in fact, only 37% of the people at the meeting during which elections were held were eligible to vote in the first place. Uh, again, pointing to the hurdles of qualifying the vote, uh, which I can talk more about in Q&A. Uh, and so the meeting agenda indicated that Erica should speak during issue number 10, 
issues on the floor and open discussion right before the spring fling raffle drawing. Uh, so after two hours into the meeting at 9.30 p.m., it seemed like it was time for agenda item number 10. Uh, but President Passad pointed to the raffle and announced, we're going to do this. Uh, so despite Steve pointing, uh, uh, despite Steve contesting point of order, point of order, uh, Passad declared that the raffle was next, and it proceeded on for the next 30 minutes until 10 p.m. Uh, and when it was finally time for Erica to speak, uh, most of the room had already cleared out. Uh, including the commanding officer and most of the other policing executives. And so Erica explained to me that everything feels like a conspiracy, uh, especially because President Passad knew exactly why Erica was present and the issue that she wanted to discuss. Um, and so nonetheless, Erica explained to the remaining audience, uh, when my sister was murdered, traffic was diverted down Broadway. I wanted five minutes. So five minutes for one day of the year, um, you couldn't respect my family. And so now we see the dilemma come to the fore. Uh, everyone in the audience focused on the fact that Erica did not have a permit. Uh, they asked, I understand you had a vigil, but if the streets were cut off, did you get permission from the precinct to cut off those streets? Um, and after Erica responded that this precinct killed her sister, so they definitely knew about the vigil, um, audience members expressed condolences yet countered that without notification, how is the precinct to assume that it's not a riot or anything else that's happening? Um, and so after Officer Hines, then voluntarily explained his side of the story that cars were honking after they stayed in the intersection for over five minutes. Uh, President Passad simply uh, intervened and concluded the meeting by thanking everyone, the few that were still in the room uh, and inviting Erica to keep in touch. Uh, so this example reflects how the police community relationships that already exist can actually protect police against neighborhood grievances. Uh, and unsurprisingly, this was the first and the last meeting that Erica attended. Um, so finally, one last point, uh, in contrast to Erica's vigils, but much like the Peace Tour, uh, Officer Hines and his partner often help the clergy council facilitate their permitless events. Uh, so the clergy council does these shooting responses where uh, they respond to each community shooting in the precinct and denounce it over a megaphone. And I asked the secretary about the logistics. Um, we'll call the police department, hey, we're gonna do a shooting response over here, uh, but there's no paperwork that we need to fill out, no documentation, nothing. Uh, and the uh, clergy council president uh, simply describes it as a courtesy call. Uh, so finally, I'm just going to briefly conclude with some implications. Um, so first, uh, going back to the concept of machine policing, uh, it establishes a new system of police accountability where democratic governance is used as a shield against public scrutiny. Um, and in the findings, we saw how uh, community councils, again, they're filled with an elected board of residents uh, it enables, it can enable police to resist public critique. Second, uh, by considering inequality from non-enforcement sources, again, the, the things that I discussed in today's talk uh, didn't involve enforcement. Uh, we see how informal and formal social control can oftentimes be blurred. So in other words, police as formal social controls can actually permeate informal social controls like community councils, which are actually resident run and have nonprofit status. Uh, and so this matters for whenever we say community alternatives should be prioritized instead of police. Uh, in a world of scarce resources where police, inter where police interaction is inevitable, uh, if you want things like sound permits, community organizations are gonna have to make hard decisions about how to navigate their relationships with police. Uh, and third, as I stated in the beginning of the talk, uh, machine policing shows how uh, police community relations that already exist are precisely what impede police transformation. Uh, and this insight pushes policy discussions to issues more complicated uh, than merely saying we need to invest in more police community relations. Uh, and so I'm happy to discuss anything else in Q&A, uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, and yeah, thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I have a million thoughts running through my head. Um, but first, let's present our next and last speaker of the conference. Um, that is Carrie Sanders from Wilfrid Laurier University, who will be presenting Gender, Police Culture, and Structured Ambivalence, Navigating Fit with the Brotherhood, Boys Club, and Sisterhood.
Thank you, Holly. Um, on behalf of my co-authors, Julie Galwus and Deborah Langan, we're really excited to be here today and to share our work with you. Um, the piece that we're gonna talk about today has actually just been accepted yesterday to feminist criminology. So we can also share it through that way. In Canada, women compromise, uh, comprise 22.2% of the total population um, in policing, with less than 19% of senior officer positions being held by women. While our numbers continue to rise, we caution against equating an increase in numbers with gender equity and argue that the idea of simple numeric increase does not create meaningful organizational change or address important concerns regarding equity. The scholarship, sorry, there we go. The scholarship on women in policing has provided many valuable insights into the gendered reality of police work. It has illustrated how policing is gendered in the way it legitimizes hegemonic masculinity and filters women into less valuable work. Research has also demonstrated how police culture plays an important role in shaping how gender inequality is created and also maintained in policing. In our work, we draw on Holly Campo's definition of police culture as resourceful tools used in, used in practice by police officers, such as through the use of narratives, and in our case, the narratives of the brotherhood, boys club, and sisterhood. And they use these narratives to make sense of their experiences, practices, and social positioning in a hierarchy. The key to unpacking culture, Campo argues, is to unveil when, where, and how particular sets of cultural resources are put to work. Understanding culture in this way enables us to see how culture is shaped by the institutional structures, as well as the meaningful actions of officers on the ground. We also draw on theorizing of Canidas and McMullen around structured ambivalence. For this concept is really helpful for us to understand the complex and at times contradictory relationship individuals encounter when they are negotiating relationships and their attempts to exercise agency collide with social structural arrangements. Our theorizing on this topic as the result of our prolonged immersion into the study of women in policing in Canada as it relates to the recruitment, retention and promotion of women. Specifically, today we're drawing on our interviews with 91 Canadian women police officers. Our sample includes 54 frontline officers, and by that we mean constable, detective, and corporal, 25 management, so at the rank of detective sergeant, sergeant staff, staff sergeant, and seven senior management officers holding positions of inspector, deputy chief, and chief, as well as five civilians. All participants in the study were white presenting and ranged from one to 30 years um, of experience with an average of 20 years in policing. The number of children for each participant ranged from zero to five with an average of two. All data were analyzed using a constructivist grounded theorizing approach, which allows us to prioritize the experience of the participants while also being reflexive and drawing on relevant theoretical concepts and insights um, that are existing in the valuable literature. Much of the research available on policing has utilized the narrative of family, the idea of the blue family or the brotherhood to refer to a sense of belonging that distinguishes policing from other realms of work. This narrative also was the case with our women that we spoke with. And as Darlene states, we're all blue. We're blue to together and this is our family. For many, the brotherhood was drawn upon to demarcate boundaries between police and the external others and was used as a form of protection and solidarity within the service. Yet surprisingly, absent from most of the reflections on the brotherhood was an explicit appreciation of the gender coded language and implications thereof. Through their articulations of the brotherhood, women engage in a process of neutralization. As Judy states here, so I think you have that crazy camaraderie, this brotherhood that you feel so protected and instinctively you want to protect each other, you all do, and you look out for each other. While many women neutralize gender when they draw upon this cultural resource of the brotherhood, 
this process of neutralization becomes disrupted when women discuss challenges and dissent within the brotherhood. Many participants articulate a clear boundaries and an informal code of conduct that officers are required to maintain their inclusion within the brotherhood. In this way, one's ability to fit within the brotherhood defends, depends in part on one's ability to, as our participants said, toe the line. During our conversations with women, it became clear that many of them saw reactions to dissent within the Brotherhood as a gendered phenomenon, as Jessica explains. So you're a member of the Brotherhood unless you challenge the men. I think that women who challenge men are immediately ostracized. So when you have those women who cry harassment, and I'm going to say cry because that's their language, you're ostracized. And you're also ostracized by the women. But I think we edit our behavior because we know it would have been me against all of them. When Jessica discusses the nuances of fit, gender emerges as this really central characteristic to the brotherhood itself. She reaffirms her own fit within the brotherhood by saying, I've never had that experience. And in this way, she effectively reminds us that women do belong within the brotherhood. However, belonging requires, as she talks about later, tolerating intolerable behavior and regulating one's own behavior. The boys club was used as a way to describe and make sense of exclusionary practices and relationships within the service. As Rachel explains, I'm walking the beat and there's a pile of guys in the front. So I get in the middle and fists are swinging and I get the one guy out and I'm looking, where's my backup? All of a sudden, when everything's done, I hear this. And I look down the road. They were watching. The guys were watching me. And I was mad. I was like, what the fuck was that? You know, what are you doing? And, oh, I just want to make sure you can handle yourself. Be one of us. For Rachel, the old boys club is used to make sense of a time where her brothers did not provide her support and protection, but instead required her to demonstrate her fit and ability to be one of us. In this way, the boys club is deeply entrenched in a traditional crime fighting mentality, what James Sheptiki discussed yesterday as this police metier. And it requires women to get in there and put their hands on people and catch bad guys to earn their place in the brotherhood. For many women, the boys club was also used to make sense of the limited advancement and inclusion of women in the, what they saw as the inner circle, as Susan explains here. If you look at our hierarchy and the number of women in positions of power in our organization, like truly you've got one, but you know, her dad was a top ranking officer at one time and she was married to a cop. The nepotism within it is, well, they talk about inclusion and diversity and how they want that to be the way our police services run. And yet they all belong to this club that excludes women. What the fuck? Like, are you kidding me? And so how do you fight that? I will never, ever be able to get into that little circle of the boys club in any way, shape, or form. The boys club became a really powerful entity that is used to maintain, that is maintained through nepotism and blatant favoritism. Some women who are willing to strategically play the game and toe the line can find their way into the inner circle. Yet, to strategically play that game, many women felt that they had to distance themselves from each other and, as Connie explains, sort of join on the bandwagon with the men and not be as friendly to the other women. So that acceptance happens, which leads us to a discussion of the sisterhood. While all women noted the existence of the old boys club and the brotherhood in policing, almost all refuted the existence of a sisterhood. However, what was really interesting is that explanations for why there isn't a sisterhood really varied. For some, a sisterhood did not exist because of a broader systemic, material, symbolic, and institutional conditions that fostered competition and divisiveness among women. For these women, sisterhood was perceived to be a threat to the status quo. So as Susan says, I think too many of the women are trying to get into the brotherhood. And I don't think we support each other enough. I really don't. I think if you're seen supporting other women, you're looked at in a negative light by the guys. The mere mention of a possible sisterhood renders the gendered nature of the brotherhood visible. 
for some of our participants, they also discussed that they didn't believe in a sisterhood because as soon as they did that, they separated themselves, which then would make it more difficult to have inclusion. So the sisterhood began to signify threats to the status quo and thus a barrier to inclusion. For others, the lack of a sisterhood within policing reflected this competition between women. Not only is competition required to successfully navigate fit, but a drive for competition is part of how women express their desire to advance up the ranks. So as Judy says, women feel directly in competition with other women because each team, let's say if it's drugs or intel, it's not a balance of five girls and five guys. It's generally 10 guys and one girl or four girls, four guys and one girl. So you're in competition with the women. You've got to be the best woman to get that one position. You're directly head to head with them, which is what breeds the cattiness between the women. Here, Judy brings attention to the limited structural opportunities, often referred to by our participants as the token ovary spot available to women. While there is likely no official mandate for only one woman to be successful, the likelihood that more than one woman will advance in an open competition is something women are aware of. In fact, during one of my ethnographies with a um, crime, a gang crime unit at a very large urban police service in Canada, I remember the sergeant in charge who it was his third tenure in this role as a sergeant. So he was going on 12 years. He mentioned to me, oh, just last year, we got our first woman ever in our unit. We didn't actually have a change room for her because they were in an undercover building. So we took the closet. We're looking to add a new member and there's actually a really great woman that's applying, but you know, we don't want two women in here. It just breeds cattiness. That idea of competition was evident when we were doing some of our ethnographies. Social movements and citizens in Canada and elsewhere are calling for widespread police reform. Some argue that ensuring police organizations better reflect the communities they serve will effectively erode the rigid, rigid division between us and them, creating more space for progressive change. However, as our research demonstrates, inclusion and diversity alone are not enough to change an organizational culture or larger structures. There are deeply embedded realities that both inform and constrain individual agency. Our analysis has captured how women both neutralize and emphasize the importance of gender as they utilize and reject three prominent cultural resources. And our analysis demonstrates that the complex relationship between structure, culture, and these on the ground practices. Participants are heavily invested in the gender neutral discourse of family as it applies to the narrative of the brotherhood. This use of the brotherhood signifies its connection to the symbolic boundary of protection, camaraderie, belongingness, and solidarity around all uniform wearing officers. And it reinforces the symbolic boundary between the family of policing and those outside of it and external to it. Yet the gender dynamics of the brotherhood are not entirely neutral. If women don't toe the line, the gendered elements of the brotherhood become clear. In this way, the relationships women have to the brotherhood are complex and nuanced. Conversely, women draw upon the cultural resources of the boys club and the sisterhood when making sense of and navigating these gender challenges that exist within policing. The investment in and rejection of these gendered discourses is strategic, we argue. To successfully play the game, women must navigate the hierarchical structure and deploy these cultural resources, such as a masculine ethos and a crime-fighting mentality. However, through their adoption and use of these cultural resources, they reproduce the very beliefs and practices that perpetuate the gendered nature of this work. It is difficult for women to build solidarity or that sisterhood when they are actively engaging in strategies of fit that paradox paradoxically reinforce those gendered boundaries. In closing, our analysis underscores the importance of the concept of structured ambivalence because it attends to both the potential for agency and the constraints on that agency when individuals are drawing on cultural resources. 
as Kanitas and McMullen noted, when substantial numbers of individuals who share a similar position attempt to negotiate the ambivalence created by current structural arrangements, there is the potential for change. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Okay, I, I just, I love the underlying themes across all three presentations. Um, I also get the sense that we get a nice, you know, uh, we, get, we get discussions of macro, meso, and more micro level dynamics at work here. So um, there are many questions. I will just scroll all the way to the top. <laughs> um, let's, let's hope we can get through many of them. Okay, question from Mert for Dr. Kraska. Can we consider certain Supreme Court decisions justifying the unlawful or yet to be lawful use of excessive force as an indirect militarization? Um, there, there's no doubt Supreme Court rulings have played a role in all of this and uh, in doing a lot of policy work with police departments and, and local legislators. Um, there, there are, there's actually a pretty good movement on the local level to start changing laws that supersede what the Supreme Court has said. And it's an interesting process that's taking place. Um, you know, the law is just, just tends to be so vague and it, it just almost seems by default provides the police a lot of discretion. And so, if, you know, if you have a reasonableness standard like in Tennessee versus Garner, and you say, you know, you got to do what's reasonable. If somebody's fleeing away and they don't pose a threat, you can't shoot them. But if you perceive them posing some kind of bodily harm threat to yourself or someone else, you can go ahead and uh, take their life. Um, that's incredibly vague and, and leads to all kinds of different things. There was a video floating around for a while where, you know, some guy was clearly just trying to get away from an altercation that he was in the midst of with the police and uh, got shot three times in the back. And, and you know, and there was a typical community uproar and what's this all about? What role does the Supreme Court play? Uh, they could certainly shore up some of their rulings, which they've not been willing to do. And overall, the legal system, probably because it's full of prosecutors, is uh, pretty bad about giving the police a free pass on a lot of laws and policies. Thank you. Okay, the next question that I will direct toward Dr. Chang from L'Oreal, who's one of our grad students. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about how the NYPD was a hard to reach population in your experience or ask differently what factors make accessing police institutions different from accessing vulnerable or marginalized populations that we normally think of as hard to reach. <laughs> I think we can all speak to that on this panel, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, um, so yeah, um, I mean, I would probably draw uh, your attention to, uh, so there's this uh, sociologist slash criminologist named Rachel Ellis at um, University of uh, Maryland, I believe. Um, and so she has this great article uh, in a methods journal about how do we understand hard to reach and trying to add nuance to that? Um, and so I would direct your attention for more information there, but, uh, but I try to make just a simple point that uh, in terms of hard to reach um, and, and how we think about that, um, there are different power dynamics uh, in how we, um, how we relate to um, our different study populations. Uh, so whereas we typically apply hard to reach to marginalized populations, and given like IRB considerations and things like that, we have to worry about how uh, we're relating to um, classically marginalized populations, whether, whether it's homeless youth, gang members, et cetera, et cetera, prison populations. Uh, but in terms of my study, uh, when I was trying to access the police department, um, in, in that case, uh, I was trying to gain access to them and there are institutional barriers in place uh, that made them kind of the quote unquote power holder in the, in the relationship. Uh, and so gaining access to them um, was a difficult experience that I never, uh, that, that, um, that they never granted me access to and led me down a pathway of collecting different alternative data sources in order to try to study, uh, study police. I also just wanna open the floor to the other panelists to see if they wanted to speak to that at all. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't mind saying something about that real quick, just because I've dealt with this for so long and worked with other academics and, you know, access to policing is very tricky. And I think it's a, it's a, it's sort of an indicator of how academe has failed in access to policing when you compare it to investigative journalists. I mean, investigative journalists have done so such better work peeling back the layers of what's going on in policing than academics have had. And, uh, and then the academics that do get involved in, in from what I've seen, you know, they, they, uh, I, I don't know how to put this kindly, but they oftentimes become co-opted by the police themselves. And so they become sort of tacit cheerleaders for that particular department because, you know, I work with a lot of police folks and, you're, you rarely run into people that are just blatantly mean spirited and, and are out there intending to do ugly things. You're talking, to, you're talking to decent folks for the most part that are trying to do a good job, but it's really easy in criminology to misconstrue that for a sober analysis of the institution and the ultimate consequences that are coming out of that institution. I don't know if that makes sense. Carrie, did, did you, I just want to open the floor to all three if you wanted to say something. Yeah, access, um, actually Kevin Hegarty and I have a podcast coming out on access uh, to criminal justice institutions that's really good and discusses this and the idea of how access is really like an onion, right? There's so many different layers and different ways in which to gain access. And I've faced many challenges at times, depending on the topic, on services letting me in and having to figure out how to navigate around that. Um, for our police women's study, for example, no one was wanting us to advertise or support it. And then when we went outside of the service, the response was over a hundred women sending in contacts asking to speak. And then when it started to get out more publicly that this was going on, then services opening up, asking us to come in to do case studies on you know, issues around gender diversity recruitment in their services. Um, so I think it's a tricky topic. There's ways to get in. I'm not sure I agree fully, Pete, that all people become co-opted when working within. I think there's ways to do critical engagement both within an institution, on the institution, and outside of it as well. Yeah. But I think it's a great topic to listen to our podcast at the Center for Research on Security Practices. So little plug. Uh, just to clarify, I didn't mean to say or give the impression that all do, but I think it's a significant problem in criminology when you have so many criminologists over the years that have promoted things based on what the police want, and they've been really detrimental to minority communities. Mm -hmm. So certainly not all, but I think it's a it's something that criminology needs to reckon with in a serious way in, in, the, in the powerful criminologists that have a strong voice in policing that have listened lock, stock and barrel to what the police have to say and then promote those same agendas. Yeah. That's yeah. problematic. That's what I'm referring to. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, my co-author Deborah Langan and I actually have a publication where we're critiquing even kind of the partnership projects that we've seen. And so in Canada, there's been a real push for even police to get some of their funding through having academic partners on the grants. And what does it mean to have an authentic partnership? Um, and then also our critique of what we see happening in a lot of these partnerships in the state of evidence-based policing, which is very similar to what you're saying as well, You know, concerns around, are they critical evaluations of policing practices? being like pushed out or is the push for all of us to have these partnerships in order to get our funds to get access to things leading to evidence being purported that's not actually critically accurate i was wondering if we would get to this topic in this conference and in the final moments we did and i'm <laughs> glad that we did it's an important conversation i will absolutely say um kevin do you have you had a question that you wanted to post to carrie yeah, I had a question for Carrie. Um, so, first of all, thanks for the plug. Listen to the podcast. Uh, um, thanks for the talk. I look forward to seeing the paper. I just want to take you beyond the paper a little bit because I know you read widely. 
And I was just wondering if you could think about your findings in the context of other traditionally or contemporarily dominated male professions, what kind of parallels there might be, or in some of the ones that have moved, well, quickly, historically speaking, uh, from male dominated to much more female dominated. I'm thinking about law. Um, so are there, is there, are there, there's different ways to think about this. Is, is that an opportunistic kind of, or um, uh, an appealing story? Uh, what, so what lessons kind of thinking more broadly about other types of professions? Yeah, that's really interesting because some of the research I've read and like chatting with Janet Chan, she's done work in the area of lawyers, right? And looking at gender in there. And you can see a lot of overlap and similarities with the experiences and the challenges that the women face in those careers. Firefighting, we see the same thing, right? The hegemonic masculinity and almost buying into that ethos to strategically navigate fit. So I think there's relevance of these findings to other really male dominated services in terms of creating change. My concern is we always focus on like, if we just get numbers stir, it's going to be addressed. And that's not addressing the real issues around equity, right? And inclusion. And I think we have to think more seriously about cultural change and how do we do that? Because that seems to be part of the issues. The culture within policing is strong and it really came out in all of our interviews and discussions. And then even in my research, which is on the use of police technologies and frontline practices, that crime fighting mentality and ethos is shaping how crime analysis and intelligence products are being produced and also deployed in practice. So the, the push for cultural change is real and necessary. Thank you. Great, thank you. So um, since I had opened the floor to the other speakers to speak to Tony's question, I'm gonna go ahead and, and let him speak to a second question as well. Um, I've got one here from Rebecca who says, Dr. Chain, thank you, really fantastic presentation. How do police collectively and individually decide which constituents are most likely to optimize their legitimacy? Is there a recognizable process there? Yeah, so um, so in the in the broader book project, I talk about how uh, I think the interesting thing about police community relations is that uh, police do want to maximize community participation uh, in their initiatives, and so they're and so when they advertise uh, community efforts, uh, they want everyone and anyone to come to them, uh, and then and then after they come to them and in those meetings, in the context of meetings and other venues, uh, then they start. Um, um, seeing how people feel towards police and start building those relationships within those specific contexts. Um, and so when, again, when, when advertising police community meetings and things like that, uh, it's definitely open to everyone. Uh, but then once those meetings unfold, uh, then they get a sense of um, who, then, then they get to feel everyone out. Um, and so one easy thing, or like one clear indicator of that is that the, um, so in, the, in some of the police community meetings that I attended, not in the community councils, but they have these other beat level meetings. Uh, they have sign-in sheets um, and the sign-in sign sheets uh, inform the invite list for future meetings. Uh, and you can imagine that not everyone on those sign-in sheets are invited to future meetings. Um, and so it, there's a process of um, cultivating relationships uh, and, and selecting um, who, who to come and invite into future meetings that um, hopefully you guys will read more about in the, in the book. Yes, so can we get a date on that? That'd be great. <laughs> when are we going to see that book? I mean, I would love a date on it too, but, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, but we'll see. Uh, no, but I'm really looking forward to seeing more of your work. Um, I see a, a lot of overlap with my own work, so it's, I find it super interesting for sure, especially in such a large city. Uh, what a great case study that you're putting forward there. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to the top because I had to skip a whole bunch. Um, question from ZT to Dr. Kraska. Uh, scholars continue to disagree on def definitions and solutions to police militarization. In your opinion, what is the solution? Demilitarization, SWAT detasking, civilian oversight? It's no, just a small question. Yeah. 
I, I, I'll just lay out a solution real quick. Um, no, but it's important because uh, you know it's it's tough. You know, I watched my daughter and uh, and her friends and lots of young folks I know really put their bodies out on the line in the United States, uh, protesting George Floyd situation, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, and you know they they were all of us were actually quite shocked at just the extreme tactics that were used by the police, uh, proactively violent, aggressive. The things they were doing uh, are, are not things that we've seen much of over the last 25 years. And so to me, it was real obvious that it indicated a new level of, of explicit militarization and, and unabashed, unabashedly so. Um, you know, what do you do about that? There's, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of emphasis on mass incarceration. There's not been much emphasis on mass policing. And I think this latest police crisis has taken at least our field from policing almost being an, being an aside or police scholars. And I know this isn't true necessarily in Canada and Europe, but certainly in the US, police scholars being fairly technically and, and uh, almost exclusively policy driven to uh, people recognize that we need the same kind of critique of mass policing as we do mass incarceration. So I think the biggest solution is retracting police power. Um, I don't think the defunding slogan is necessarily helpful in that, but because uh, it's just not realistic and it just, it ends up being the lightning rod that everything ends up going to and then nothing gets done. But uh, there are a lot of ways to retract police power and, and I think that's the key thing that has to be done. Uh, one of the interesting things that's happening in the United States anyway is just uh, widespread legalization of marijuana. And uh, I, I think that those kinds of measures can have a, a real impact. Uh, yeah, tough question. <laughs> yeah, difficult indeed. Um, okay, this question for Dr. Sanders. Um, the uh, well, I'm not sure if you can speak to this. If you can't, just, just say so. Uh, the Canadian military has recently received a lot of attention on patriarchal culture. Um, are gender aspects of police forces in Canada similar to the military or dissimilar? Um, up to you if you want to speak to that. Yes. No, that's a great question. Um, I've only read little pieces of academic literature in the area. I've obviously read lots of the news stories. And Joe, just from that, you can see the similarities come out um, between, but I can't say anything really academically strong at this point because I haven't read enough of the research. Yeah, that's definitely an area, um, a major gap uh, when it comes to, to Canadian research in general and the military, sociology of the military. Yeah. Um, unless, unless I'm wrong about that, Kevin, that's definitely an interest of yours, but I, I, think, I'm, I think I'm right. So. Um, okay, so I... Uh, I think maybe we're gonna wrap things up there. That, I just wanted to you know, save some time to give an official uh, sign off because this is the last panel of our uh, conference on police and policing for the Center for Criminological Research. Uh, we just, you know, we are so grateful to all of our speakers. Um, what a fantastic group of scholars that, um, that said yes, <laughs> especially at such a, a difficult time. Um, so we really appreciate it on behalf of my colleagues and myself. Um, so yes, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our uh, graduate student assistants in the, the background doing some of this, uh, this work of getting your questions to us and also some of the preparation on the front end. Also definitely thank you to Jeff, uh, who is sort of our, our person who handles all things tech, not only to get the show on the road, but to keep the show on the road. So thank you very much to you. Um, and of course, thank you to our audiences. Uh, all of your fantastic questions have really allowed for some great uh, discussion, some good engagement. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And with that, uh, we're gonna sign off. I wish you all a good day. And for all of the academics and students out there, a uh, good end of term.